there's nothing else you really remember from last week, keep in mind what we talked about when we mentioned that Trojan horse. And, and, and I said before, I don't know if any of you know the story um, of, of Troy, but there was uh, a horse that was taken into a uh, left outside of the gate because they could not break the gate. They couldn't overtake the city by siege. So the attacking city left, but when they left, they left a horse outside the city um, as a, as a, I guess, a tribute to their god. They paid with flattery in their head. Left the horse outside the city, but inside the horse were soldiers who would stay quiet and they would rest until, they would stay rested until that city went to sleep and were drunk from their celebration. And when nighttime came, what was inside that Trojan horse came out of the horse and opened up the gates of the city and the city was conquered. The souls all flooded the city and the city was conquered. What it was is that the city allowed this horse to be brought in and never ever check to see what the, the uh, circumstances or what would be the consequences of that being brought into the city. Inside that city was their enemy. And in the same sense we've been talking about sin, that's what we're looking at. Changing the pattern of sin in our life is something that I think every believer needs to focus on. Not when you first get saved, and not even right before you die. Throughout your entire life, pray that God help you change those patterns. Now on your outline, I don't know if you noticed, I got a bunch of apples. One is a nice whole apple, and this apple is representing the fruit in the garden that shouldn't have been ever bit the first time. Amen. And I don't know where you are in your life. I think the last picture I have is an apple core. Somebody tore that fruit up. So whether you've only bit it once or maybe you've bit it twice, I don't know where you are, but we've got to change these patterns. Because we cannot continue to indulge sin or live in sin or commit sin in our lives and expect to be where we want to be in the end. Amen. God and sin cannot cohabitate. So sin has to be dealt with every day. Not just when you're baptized, it's not dealt with once and forgotten. You have to deal with your sin every single day in your mind. How you approach it, how you deal with it, has to be a regular event. Whether it's every hour, whether it's every day. I don't know, some of y'all may be willing to admit you sin once a day. Some may, some may not be even willing to admit that. Maybe you say, I sin once a week. Or I've been holy so long, I've been church so long, I'm sinning once a month these days. I don't know how you do it, but when you recognize your sin, you better repent. Okay, I just do this. Every minute, every hour of the day, forgive me, Jesus. And I just keep it right at the front of my mind. I don't even want to partake. And when I'm at the threshold, or right at the edge of temptation, I really get down dirty with my prayer. Lord, help me. Because I want to do this. Or I don't want to do this. Especially at 4 o'clock in the morning when he says, get out of bed and intercede. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to do this. But you know by not getting out and praying for your brother or sister, you're sinning? Do you know that sin? See, how you define it, what you come to understand about it, grows as you walk and progress in God. But what I want to encourage you to do is begin to change the pattern of sin in your life. The more you focus on it, the more you're able to recognize it, or at least deal with those Trojan horses that may contain it, the more you're going to stop living. You're going to sin less. Amen? Okay, you're not, you may not even sin less until Jesus comes back, but you're definitely going to sin less. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, 21 to 24, again this morning. We read this last week, but I want to keep reading it in your hearing so that you, you, you really understand what the scriptures try to say. When you heard about Christ, and you were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. What was your former way of life? Sin. Everything you learned about Christ Jesus had to be attached to your former life, which was sin. Because Jesus, that was his purpose. His main purpose was to deal with sin on planet Earth. To deal with sin subterranean, underneath the Earth. There is no sin in heaven. But everywhere sin found its way or crept into the world, God, Jesus came to deal with that sin. Even that residue of sin that's still left over in you right now. I'm a Paul, I'm a offended pastor. You don't know me that well, you. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know that I know there's a residue of sin yeah. left in you. How do you know that, Pastor? Because your body is still under the curse of sin. 
see anybody being translated like Enoch or I don't see your body is still sinful. Uh -huh. Your heart may be right. Your mind may be getting better. And even then, I don't think there's anybody with a right mind in here where it should be. All of us are growing into the mind of Christ. But your body for sure, show I can see your body right now. I can almost see you dying right now. Uh -huh. You didn't look as good in your body as you did last week. Nadia, she's a beautiful young girl. <laughs> she did. She was tearing up. I'm looking at her now. Like, Ooh, look at the pro feet on the side of her face. What's going on, man? I mess with Nadia because I can't. None of us are getting prettier and younger and stronger. Why? Nobody wants to say it? Sin. 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 The curse of sin. Everlasting life has been postponed in your, in your physical body. Why? Because somebody ate what they should have eaten. And somebody is continuing to eat what they shouldn't eat. The, the sooner we're, we stop being afraid to say it uh -huh. and admit it, the sooner we can start dealing with the problems in our life. But as long as you try to hide from me your sin, uh -huh. you're not going nowhere. You trick me and I don't care. That's between you and God. But the minute you start becoming real with yourself and start admitting, I still have to deal with sin in this body. This body still is connected to the same flesh and desires and defects that it was born in. And I have to make a conscious, conscious effort to, to bypass or get over that. Verse 22, you were taught in regards to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is, and that word is, is present tense, which is being corrupted it's deceit, uh, by its deceitful desires. Your body is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. It is. There's things in your life that you want that are not what you need and it's bringing you down. Uh -huh. And those desires will ultimately try to kill you. In other words, those Trojans are full of things that once they're let loose inside the camp will cause all kind of havoc and you'll be dealing with trying to clean that mess up for years to come. So then it goes on to say, created um, um, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. There is holiness on earth, but holiness on earth is a pure heart and a clear conscience toward God. That's what God means when he says be perfect. Because the perfection in your body is yet to come. He intends to perfect your body, but it hasn't come yet. He already saved your heart. If you have the Holy Ghost at the table of your heart, and you're now with a new spirit and the Holy Ghost is inside of you, he's already saved your heart. He can embrace that, he can love on that, and he does. Yes. Look at Brother Peter. Yes. Morning by morning, fresh mercy, wonderful joy. You come, before you even come to church, you add church. Why? Because yes. the church is in you. He is in you. So you've been saved in your heart. The Bible says we're being transformed, we're being renewed where? In our thinking, in our soul, in our mind. We're being changed to become in the likeness of Christ. That means you got things you've got to learn. You've got to grow in that likeness. But you're going to yet be saved. So you're continually being saved in your mind, but you're yet to be saved in this body. But the Bible says there's a day where the trumpet of God sounds and in the twinkling of an eye. You'll be caught up into heaven. You'll be changed from mortality to immortality. And that's a great hope. There'll be no more crying. Why? You won't have tear ducts to cry. You won't want to cry. There'll be no more tears. No more crying. No more sorrow. You will be like him. You will be with him. What he is, you will be. That's the hope we have. Everything we enjoy in Christ right now is great. And I thank God for it. But I have a hope in something better. What's better? Leaving the sinful body behind. Yeah. Well, not leaving it, it'll be changed. Yeah. So when we talk about sin saints, I don't want you to I don't want you to think that you're, you're I hate to say it, you're not a sinner, you are saved. But that salvation is a progressive salvation. You're you're being changed and worked on and fixed day by day. More, more and more. You're gonna go higher and higher. There's greater places than God than where you're at today. And his intention is to take you there. So the secret to changing our life is not in your willpower. And that's what I want to highlight right now. But today we're talking about change requires a new way of thinking. So your willpower is not what it's going to take to change you into what God intends for you to be. Amen. It's God giving power through the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And I don't care what you say. Call it Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. 
Okay, whatever makes you happy. But without it, you can't change. You cannot change. Your willpower is not. Tony Evans, who's ever, don't raise your hand. Got some Tony Evans books up on your shelf. It's not going to work. Tony Evans can't get it for you. In fact, the Holy Ghost can get it for you. Because what we're going after is not produced in the earth. What we're going after is produced somewhere else. And there's only one way to obtain it. Okay, so we have, we want this power, but we need to get it through the Holy Ghost or through the Holy Spirit. So change in our lives, saints, is going to require a new way of us, a new way of thinking for us. And the battle to change those defects in our life is always going to be fought in the mind. A Joyce, Joyce Myers wrote a wonderful book. If you haven't read it, I know the ladies read it a few months ago, years ago. A Battlefield of the Mind. Powerful, powerful book. This is where it all goes down, y'all. You know? How you come out of any given situation, how you come out thinking towards God, towards your situation is where God is pleased or displeased. Your body is still in the mess. Your heart is right there with God, but this is what's being changed and how it's going to proceed and what it's going to do to obey the word of God. The battle is in the mind. A new way of thinking is what we all have to position ourselves for. Can you teach an old dog new tricks? If you get saved at 70 years old, I'll tell you this much, you better learn some new tricks. But you know what? I guess you can't really call a 70 year old person that got saved an old dog because the Bible says you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Everything new can be reset and can be reconditioned. So it starts in the mind, and that's where it's won or that's where it's lost. Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verse 23 says this. To be made new in the attitude of your mind. In the attitude of your mind. How do you think? How do you get up in the morning and how do you go up and find you beautiful? <laughs> she ain't hurt. I know she's not hurt. How do you get up and how do you go? How do you go to work? What's in your mind? What's your attitude? Oh, Monday. You play the same game everybody else in the city is playing. Christ wants you to have a different mind. Yes, Lord. You should yes. be happy that you got a whole new week to lay new treasures yes, in heaven. Lord. Yes. I got a whole new week to tell somebody about Jesus. Because I didn't hear my quota last week. Yes. But I got I've been given the grace to hit a new week and tell somebody else about what God has done. Or to see the glory and the blessings of God manifested in my life. A new week ahead yes. of me. What is there to be sad about unless you're stuck in your old pattern of sin? A slave doesn't get up on Monday and say, oh, a slave of the world, though. I'm not, not a slave of God. A slave didn't get up in the morning, oh, look at that field that's been growing all weekend. Can't wait to get me and my children out there and start picking that mess. Slaves don't think like that. I can't wait, oh, the barn burned down last week. I know we got to get out there and build a new one. All right. That's not how slaves think. Mondays to sinners and Mondays to slaves are not a blessing. But Mondays to God's people are a blessing. Hallelujah. In whatever you're doing, and though you may be a slave to Christ, his yoke is easy. And he pays better than any other any other master in any universe nearby. Better. Infinitely better. Y'all look at me funny. Pastor, you better stop talking about it. Preach it, preach it, preach it. I'm trying to help you understand. Yes, Lord. That how, what your attitude is about how you live your life is what is important. So you've got to deal with the mind. You've got to deal with what's going on in here. So you're not going to change until your thoughts and your attitudes begin to change. So this is why your daily quiet time is very important. When I say daily quiet time, I'm referring to your Bible reading time, your prayer time, that time that you, you take for spiritual renewal, that you take to talk to the Lord, to settle yourself, Kids maybe off to school, husband gone, or, or vice versa. You got that time, husband, to leave everybody and go drive to work. And that 15 minute drive might be your private. I don't know when your quiet time is. Hopefully it's the minute your knees hit the floor when you get out of bed in the morning. But whatever that time is, when you really begin to come before the Lord and say, it's a new day. Here's a choice I have to make. Now I'm going to approach this day. I'll approach it in you. Lord. Choose you this day who you're going to serve, man or God. Well, I'm serving you, Lord. Yes. That's your private time. Yes. And it reprograms you. It resets his word in your life. Studying his word and praying. It's a renewal. It renews your mind, your soul. 
and it, it sets it, it renews your spirit rather, and which reprograms or programs your mind for the day, your attitude. And, and it has to be something that happens every day in your life. And if you're not doing that, saints, you're not going to change, and you won't receive the power to change, because it's the teaching and the guidance of the Holy Ghost as the Holy Ghost hears the Word of God repeated in your life. Yes. That's why reading your Bible is important. Yes. Spirit hears the Word of God. What can you do with that in my life? And he'll turn on buttons and push things that will activate you. Read his Word. Pray. Take that morning to reset your attitude. Very important. The most important time of the day. Amen. And then you can smile the rest of the day because you have a, you have a mission now. You have a purpose. You're not going to be walking blind. You're going to be walking with a purpose in your day. You'll have a path in your steps, so to speak. So, the theological term that we talked about, and actually we talked last week about defects. And let me tell you what how defects are compared to sin. Defects are uh, um, pouting. Pouting is a defect. Because even though you're not sinning when you pout, pouting comes from what? Uh, incontentment, the flesh. There's something in you that's just not content. And you want everybody to know it. So you have a habit. Young girls develop this habit. I'm working, I'm molding and trying to work my, what do they call it when you are forging? Yeah, forging this dent out of my daughter right now. She has the ability to pout and think it's going to give her what she wants. Uh -huh. So what I have to do is every time she pouts, make sure we don't give her what she wants. But actually, let's give her what she doesn't want. So maybe we can curb this. But if you don't, you grow up allowed to pout, you become a spoiled brat. You throw temper tantrums. You start getting, you become more selfish. In other words, you're building calluses in your mind that are oh, very man. difficult to work with. Yeah. What movie was that? I don't know what movie that was. Maybe it was Shanani on the Martin Show. She put her foot, somebody put her their foot on the uh, pedicure stand. And they had to get grinders out. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Grinders and jackhammers and go to work. You don't want your heart to be like that, y'all. You don't want your heart to be like that. So you've got to understand, how do you, these are these are Trojans. Inside of that, though, if you don't deal with pounding, yeah, your mom lets you get away with it, your daddy lets you get away with it, and all your boyfriends have let you get away with it, but now Christ is trying to develop you into something else. Jesus was not a pounder. He didn't go around. Peter, I told you yesterday what I want you to do. Peter didn't, but Jesus didn't pound. And you don't, we don't pound. But it's a Trojan. And if you allow this defect in your life, guess what's coming out of it? Sin. It's a matter of time. You got uh, um, complaining. Same thing. Laziness. Laziness in itself isn't a sin. But God, if God's telling you to do things and you're lazy, yes. it's going to lead to sin. Right. Stubbornness. It's rebelliousness. <laughs> With a prettier term, it sounds nicer to be stubborn than to be rebellious. But it's the same thing. The stubbornness is a Trojan horse. You're a stubborn person. You have stubborn tendencies. Guess what? Your food, there's all kinds of sin ready to destroy you from the inside out. Covetousness. You're the kind of person who always wants what somebody else has. You have the eye that you always want. You're in trouble. Sensuality. Oh, Pastor, I can be sensual. Yeah, with your husband or wife. Outside of that, you better leave that mess alone. I just have to rub lotion when we think about somebody. Did I just do all that? We cut that from the video. But you know what I'm talking about. Sensuality can only lead to one feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So you know what? That's not even this Trojan into the camp. If I'm not married, come on, just take you. Come on. I'm gonna that from the video. If I'm not married and I have no business being sensual, let's leave sensuality alone until the time is right. Amen. Uh, it's a Trojan. Amen. It's a defect. And some people were just raised. To be sensual, taught by their mamas to please the husband. They ain't got married yet, but they're sensual little beings. Gotta be careful. <laughs> selfishness. Selfishness is a defect. You roll selfishness up in your camp. Oh, a bunch of sins coming out of that. Impatience. And your patience possesses you. So if you're an impatient person, this is one of my biggest ones. I'm, I'm an impatient man, especially on the road. I don't like to be behind the slow drive. Ooh, let me tell you this story. I was going, I was going, I don't know who I was picking up, but I was going down the street. I had the boys in the car with me, but there was a lady in front of me, and she had to be going 25 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. 
and then I think it was switching to 45. And on the side of me was this other old lady driving. And I'm just, and I had to be somewhere. Just, I, you know, I might do better now than I used to do. I don't say, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I'm not crazy, but in my mind, I'm just talking about my heart, my attitude. And I pull up, I get ready to pass the day next to me. It has happened to me once before with the same person. Guess who it is, right next to me? Anto. Did you say Anto? My auntie was right next to me. She's the one I'm getting mad at. But as soon as I get ready to pass her, I wasn't going to say nothing to her, but I was going to give her at least an eye glance like that. But I went, <laughs> straighten up real quick. Impatience, impatience will mess you up. And it's so, it's so slick. Be careful. Don't let that Trojan in. Violent or harsh behavior. Some of us are just more violent, heavy handed, just harsh kind of people. You just gotta say it like it is. Our daddies were disciplinarians, or our moms were disciplinarians, and they just kind of taught us how to lay it down. And we just have that in our demeanor. But you know what? It's very difficult to serve Christ in an effective way if you're a violent and a harsh person. You can't. This is a defect that you have to work on. You have to get it out. The theological term for, for changing our mind is the word repentance. Yeah. Repentance is a Greek word called, uh, I don't know how to say it, metanoia, yeah. Yeah. I believe, something like that. But what it means is to change, completely change. And I'm not talking 90 degrees or 360, 180 degree change. Go the opposite way of how you thought before. And, and, and this is a term, a term of thinking, a new way of thinking about it regarding our defects in life. How do I think about our defects? And these defects, and remember, have often been they were strengths in our lives that we were misusing. Some of our defects are things in our lives that we were simply just not using the right or proper or correct way. But um, uh, to change from something, yeah, I'm talking so dramatically, that change would be from turning to death to life. That's a big one. Or change, turning from sin to forgiveness. That's a big one. For heaven to say, I'm not going to destroy them in their sin, but I'm going to forgive them. Thank God for repentance. Uh, um, guilt, uh, guilt to peace of mind. One time some of us have some serious guilt. Some of us may still have a lot of guilt in our life, but God will change that. It is your decision to walk in that change and go from that getting up guilty every day to having peace every day. Peace with yourself. Peace with people around you. Peace with heaven. This is a change that you have to consciously invite into your life. Um, a change between hell and heaven. Where once you pretty much knew you were going to hell and there's nothing else to do about it, now you're actually starting to think about what it would be like in heaven. What it would be me and saying to God? Me, somebody heaven loves? Where once you, you never even pictured yourself going to heaven, so you just became worse and worse. But now some of you in here, I, I can look at you right now, and you, you, you told me your testimony. You shouldn't be here. But the grace of God has changed your mind in believing that you're who he says you are. Yes. Praise the Lord. He, Paul himself, he was still really a Christian. God took Paul and changed Paul's mind. And Paul allowed him to change his mind. Now Paul served Christian. Amen. That's change. That's repentance. Glory to Changing God. what you were yes. into what God needs you to be. That's a new way of thinking, saying, and you probably never thought about it that way, but that's repentance. Even your habits, some of the things you used to do, those are repentance. Mm -hmm. I have a habit. I, I'm, I'm a two-pack cigarette smoker a day. I'm going to change my thinking. I'll drop from two packs to one pack. You know what? I thought the pastor was going to be mad at you. I think that's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But you know what I'm praying for? I'm praying for the day you don't need any packs a day. Because mm -hmm. God is able to kill that. But until you are changing your attitude about cigarettes, and the effects of that in your life. Now I'm not saying that cigarettes are the sin, but what happens when you get 60 years old or 59 years old and you're dying of lung cancer because you disobeyed God 30 years earlier when he told you to leave those cigarettes alone because I have purpose for you at 65. There's, there's a meeting that you're going to make at 67 that you have to be there for. So stop smoking at 33. But you didn't. You kept on. So what was one what is a defect now has become sin in your life. You're not completing your purpose in God because you're cut. This is what I think about every time you like eat something I shouldn't eat. 
Lord, is, it, is there something I'm doing? Am I doing myself? A lot of times we think the quicker we die, the quicker we go to heaven. But God may have appointments for you to make. And he's telling you to do things so that you will make it to that appointment. But when we don't listen, that's sin. So we've got to be very careful. We've got to change the way we think. Change our mind. So a lot of our defects were often strengths that God gave us that are being misused. Uh, a zealous individual, Paul being one, a zealous person. Um, what God, what was being misused against Christians, God used that same zeal that Paul had to bless the Gentiles. Amen. Yeah. Well, thank God for that exact same yeah. gift God put in Paul. All God had to do was convince him to use it for his purpose and his yeah. glory. Yeah. What a blessing. Uh, a knowledge, intellect. Mm -hmm. But some people are just scholars. Wouldn't it be awesome if Dawkins... The, the evolutional fellow uh, converted to, to creationism? Wouldn't that be awesome? The foremost authoritarian over, over evolution, the theory of evolution, outside of Darwin, uh, who's written many books on it, pinning a new book about God and creation. That would, be, that would turn the world upside down. If you pray hard enough, guess what God will do? There's no difference in Dawkins and Paul. Paul had to get thrown off of his horse hard. Because Paul was set on doing what he thought his heart, in his heart he was doing for God. Dawkins is no different. He believes in his heart with all of his heart to be faithful unto his God. That's the preacher he's preaching. His God happens to be himself. But he's preaching it with that kind of zeal. Intellect and knowledge can be turned into a blessing. Um, an affable person, or a person with a lot of charisma. You know those people that just melt, you just melt. You just can't, you just can't help but like them. Some of those people are the same ones who will lead you to an island called Gehenna. <laughs> and will pour you some Kool-Aid. Those same people that you just love to hear them preach on Sunday morning. You love to be close to them. You just can't wait to carry his back. It's the same one that can lead you to death. Because they have a gift. Or vice versa. Amen. God can change these things. Me and Minister Briscoe, I think we're talking about David. And David, who was cunning, slick, and just shrewd, God anointed him to be that. Happened to use that same sickness against Bathsheba's husband. Sent the man who was so loyal to him that when God, when David called him back to the city to sleep with his wife, who David had already impregnated, but David was trying to cover his sin, called this man Uriah back to sleep with his wife so that if she got pregnant, remember the night you came home and y'all were there? But this man was so loyal, he said, I will not go be with yes. my wife yes. while my brothers are fighting Amen. on the battlefield. Yes. Which, by the way, is where David should have been. Uh -huh. But for whatever reason, the gift that God had given him, the strategy, the cutting, the shrewdness that God had given him, he used it against Uriah, put Uriah back on the battlefield to have him killed. Yes. Because Uriah didn't sleep with his own wife, put him on the front lines, Uriah was gone the next day. Same anointing. Well, cunning, slick. Same one that's used in the wrong way. Some even look at physical health and your looks. How you are, how your body, your physique, your speed, your stamina. All of this stuff can be used negatively or it can be used in a positive way. We have to decide what we want to do. Amen. God did not give me 2020 vision to look at porn. Come on, come on. I'm going to leave it right there. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 and 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Yes. In your relationship with each other, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus had. What mindset did Jesus have when he looked at you? Uh, I'll give, I love you so much, I'll lay down my life for you. Yeah. That's how Jesus looked at everybody. <laughs> He loved everyone. His attitude when he approached everyone was that, man, they're going to take up my time. They're going to ask me for some money. They're going to do, you know, they're going to distract me. Gonna... That wasn't how Jesus approached. That's how we do sometimes. That's not how Jesus approached people. Jesus knew, I'm here for you. I love you. The Bible tells us with that same attitude, we approach people. We don't give people an ugly look and you get on my nerves. I'm tired of you. We give people... The same attitude Christ gave them, and he took a lot of time with them. He shared with them, he invested in them, he talked to them as many as he could. He built them up, encouraged them, 
And that's what we should do also. So God wants us to learn to think like the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I do that? Again, it's a choice, saints. It's a choice. But what is the choice? That's the next part. part. Remember, willpower won't get it. Willpower alone won't do it. You've got to make the choice to, to ask the question, how does the Lord think? What's in his mind? Amen. What does the word of God say about a situation? So we need more power, but it's not willpower. We need God's power in our life. Let's talk about the fruits of the Spirit as I close very quickly. Fruits of the Spirit. Those are qualities that God puts in our life. Um, that puts in our life where the Holy Ghost is allowed to live through me. These are deposits on the other side, not the negative side. These are deposits. Imagine this much. Instead of a Trojan horse being brought into your city center, how about a space-age weapon that will disintegrate all your enemies outside the camp being brought and put inside your city? A new cannon on top of the fence. So when the devil and all his little minions start running to the gate, you just zap them away. Well, now, wouldn't that be a blessing? That's what it is. That's the other side. When the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, just like putting a cannon that is so it is able to destroy sin, no matter where it is, in, around, or as it approaches your life. Nothing can stand against the most powerful weapon in sin, rather. No sin can stand against that weapon. And that weapon is Jesus Christ. Jesus. And his precious blood. And walking in that. And moving in his spirit. So now, instead of you taking the Trojan into your city, you've taken the power of God into your city. The Holy Ghost into your city. Hallelujah. Sin can't stand. They can Hallelujah. pack it up and go home because yes. they're not getting in here. Yes. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do. Get the defects out of the way and let the Holy Ghost begin to curb your attitude. Even I know you want to say what you want to say. And even the temptation and desire to say it isn't bad. But what your attitude is about that, that's what you got to work on. Actually, let me take it back. You shouldn't even have it. Eventually, you won't even have the attitude to put somebody in your place. Hallelujah. The attitude will always be, what can I do to build this relationship yeah, with this person? Yeah, yeah. Yes, they do get on my nerves. It's the most nice way I say that. They hurt me. They bother me. But what can I do to make this a better relationship for him? And wait for him. And be nice and smile until he helps. Amen. It's as simple as that. Have a better attitude. So what are those? What are the fruits of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Wonderful fruits in your life. How does God produce the fruit in your life? He doesn't do it by willpower. You don't just go out and say, I'm going to be more patient today. Without the Holy Ghost, you can't do it. A man can't just say, I'm going to be a patient person today. It doesn't work. The Holy Ghost is there to produce fruit, not willpower. Amen. The Holy Ghost is here to produce fruit. The Holy Ghost um, has to grow things from within you. It places the seed in you, and there's time for that seed to grow and eventually come out of it. Amen. Your heart becomes a garden, so to speak. Amen. Yeah. A garden to the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And patience is anything you're going to get on any external book you read, even Tony Robbins, none of these problems. None of these guys are going to be able to give you patience. Your willpower alone is not going to be able to give you true patience. It has to be cultivated inside, and your heart is where the Holy Ghost develops these things. It's like somebody, you can't just say, I'm going to be more patient. I'm, I'm going to be more loving today. Based on willpower. Willpower won't let you do it. It's like trying to take some oranges and put a hook in them and tie some string to them and hook in them to a eucalyptus tree. Let's take about three bags of oranges Tie some string and hook them up to a eucalyptus tree. And then stand back and say, I got a horn the tree. <laughs> okay, that's really what using willpower is. It's ridiculous. People go walk by and be like, he ties some orange to a eucalyptus tree. The saddest part is, he believes that's an orange tree. He's convinced himself that that's an orange tree. Or you convince yourself that the love that you're showing to the best of your natural ability is the love of Christ. Anybody spiritually can see you're faking it. You're trying to be loving. You know, you smile while I'm in your face. But things uh -huh. change real quick when you're back turned. Come on. Come on. Yeah. You're trying to appear to be something. And, and people, that's the sad part. People see it. All right. Just like they see the person who's tying the oranges to a eucalyptus tree. That's not an orange tree. Just because you put some oranges on it doesn't make it an orange tree. 
Only Christ can produce his fruit through you if he's planted it in you. Amen. And it becomes his seed. It becomes his fruit. Living and working through you. So how does the Holy Ghost work in your life? It takes its time. It's gradual. There's a maturation period. You don't just give, oh, I need some joy today, Lord. Give it to me right now, Jesus. You, you have to build it in you. You have to prepare yourself. Cultivate it. For Corinthians chapter 318. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, like a mirror, the glory of the Lord, and are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Yeah. In other words, in, from ever-increasing glory. In other words, whatever glory God has already placed on you, it's going to continue to increase. It's going to be bright. It's not an instant glory. It's an increasing glory. It's a process. And we have to walk in that process. And we have to nurture that process. You know, I'm not as happy as I know I could be, but I'm happier than I was yesterday. Yeah. Okay, I, I may not have as, as much love towards you as I did last week or, or as I could have, but I definitely got more love towards you than I did right. a week ago. Probably because that gift certificate to in and out burger was a blessing this week. Keep up the love. And maybe I, you know, God will grow, He will grow you, but you got to give Him room and give Him time to grow you. Amen. So God wants to make, uh, when, when actually when God wants to make a mushroom, it takes about six hours to do so. But when God wants to make an oak tree, it takes about 60 years to do so. So the question becomes, what are you going, what do you want to be? A mushroom or an oak tree? Because a mushroom fades away almost as fast as it pops up. An oak tree, if it's fully developed, will last a long time. It'll be strong. It'll be useful for something. You can't build a house. Can you build a house there with mushrooms? You dehydrate them and you put enough of them together. I don't know, maybe you can build a plank. I don't know, but you can't build a house with mushrooms. That's why the maturation period is six hours. You get what you, you get what, you know, you get what you put into it. But an oak tree, you can build some solid structures with oak. Okay, so it depends on what you're willing to do. Are you willing to walk with Christ and let him develop over time? Or do you want all of it right now? And if he doesn't do it right now, I'm out of here. I'm going to do something else in life. And I want you to have the attitude to give time and give patience to the Lord. You need to collect all your hurts. You need to collect all your habits and all your hang-ups overnight. Saints, it took a long time. It took a lot of time, man, to get all messed up. The way some of us are. We're messed up. We look good on Sunday mornings, but it's time for murder. We're scarred, we're abused. And we're trusting Sunday by Sunday, day by day, that the Lord will heal us and will bring us out. There's a lot of pain. And it didn't happen overnight. It, it took a lot of time, amen, to do that. I had a friend one time approach me and said, Carl, you gotta help me solve my marriage, solve my marriage. You gotta get this thing done, and then I'm, 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 I'm looking at him, I'm willing to try, and after this, you know, at least get into it. If he's inviting me into a situation, go in as much as I can. So I asked the question, how long have you been married? Maybe about 15 years, all right. How long have you had this particular problem in your marriage? I just started about five years after we got married, so about 10 years, okay. So how long are, then my next question is, so how long are you willing to do what you have to do to fix this marriage? And that's where everything kind of changes, because they've already ordered the divorce paperwork. They've already talked to the lawyer. They've already set their attitude about their marriage in place. So they want me somehow to fix it. If I can't fix it this weekend or help them come up with a magical cure to fix their marriage, they're going to move to the next step. So I'm very careful that people know you don't fix a marriage quicker than you hurt and mess up a marriage. Is it possible that God can heal it? Yes. But more than likely, if it took you 10 years to hate on her and do all the things you did to her, it's going to take you another 10 years to build yourself back up in loving her and giving her what you told her you'd give her in the first place. It takes as much time to make a marriage healthy as it did to make her a marriage. And you got to be willing to invest that into it. If you aren't willing to do that, don't bother me. Don't stress me out. Let me use my extra time to keep my marriage okay. You understand what I'm saying? 
Our people come to council with pastors and leaders and they, they bring all these troubles and they nail that church. And the answer you give them is never what they want. Why? Because they're impatient. They've got too many defects to deal with the real issues of life. Their children playing like they're grown-ups, dressed up like grown-ups. The saints, when you're dealing with sin, you got to be willing to take the time and take the effort to put sin in its place. Amen. So, you don't one second, five second answers don't come from me. We got to peel this onion one layer at a time. There's probably going to be a whole lot of crying, Robin, as we peel this onion. One layer at a time. Amen? Amen. Amen. Y'all still with me. So the Holy Ghost works in us. And, and, and the Holy Ghost teaches us to gradually become more and more and more like Him. The mind of Christ is reaffirmed, reestablished, and reprogrammed into this mind. Amen. God's purpose becomes stronger and stronger. And our character becomes stronger and stronger. You know, your character is the sum total of your habits. And your attitude, that's what your character is going to be. So the important thing is to develop care, develop the right habits and the right attitude and our character will fall in line. So our responsibility, Saint, is to develop these habits. Our responsibility is allow God to work in us, but also be willing to change our mind or change our way of thinking about a certain thing. Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise this morning.